Hey everyone, today we have episode number three of the Cream Podcast with our fearless host, Jason Matthews. Jason, how are you? Doing good. Episode tres. Episode tres. Thank you. I'm super excited about doing episode number three of Cream. Cash rules everything around me. Cream gets your money. Dollar dollar deal, y'all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or like we like to say, cash rules everything around us. And that's why we need this podcast. Definitely. Cash rules everything around us. We see it more and more every single day. Hey, and Jason, in this segment of the podcast, we have our shout out. Jason, who would you like to give a shout out to today? Definitely. I want to give a shout out to Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay. On December 5th, they're having a great fundraiser. Um, Alzheimer's of the East Bay is adult daycare for people with memory loss and dementia. I'm actually on their board and they're doing a great fundraiser December 5th in Berkeley. Come out and support is a great opening public fundraiser that they're doing to raise money during these hard times for them. Uh, what a great cause and what a great organization. So that's your shout out of the podcast. All right, Jason, this segment of the podcast, you're going to talk about a product or service that you utilize as a financial planner that's helping a lot of your clients. Yeah, definitely. What I want to do is I actually want to remind people of the deadlines for certain contributions. So re- just as a reminder, if you over the age of 70 and a half, Remember that your required minimal distribution withdrawal has to be done by the end of this year, December 31st. And remember, if you're over 70 and a half, that means you have to take a small portion out of your individual retirement account, form a K plan, or any qualified retirement plan. So make sure you do that, uh, that withdrawal beforehand. If not, it is a 50% penalty for the total balance if you do not do it before the end of this year. Whoa, that is super important. So yeah, people need to rewind the podcast and listen to that one again, or even better, just contact you for help, huh? Yes, sir. We definitely help you out with that. All right, Jason, this segment of the podcast, we're going to talk about a stat that I saw recently. Um, It was through quarter three of 2021, Um, but it talks about net income generated per second for certain tech companies. So every single second, these companies are averaging this amount of net income. Um, Do you want to tell us what those are? Yeah, so every second, Apple makes $3,002. Alphabet, or Google, what you call it, makes $2,239. Microsoft makes $2,150. Facebook or the new name Meta is making $1,278 per second. And the cheapest of the big five is Amazon at only $833 per second. Per second. Apple, $3,000 per second. What I see from those numbers, too, is the difference. I'm amazed at the difference between, you know, the the Facebook or Amazon versus Apple. Um, They're, you know, more than doubling or almost tripling. Yeah, I'm really surprised about that. I guess because Apple has Apple Music, more subscription-based products than Amazon, even though they do have the Prime, I'm assuming people are always clicking for new songs and music, which drives up the cost uh, for it. So I'm just, I'm surprised that Amazon and Apple price difference per second. Yeah. Um, is that much so Jason, uh, what, what would you say? How much do you make per second? Oh man, a penny, a penny or two per second compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> I need you on the Amazon level, man. Let me step it up. We're not in the uh, in the definitely the not in the ballpark of Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook. But uh, maybe if we if we made Amazon money per day, that would be a great goal, huh? Make Amazon money per day. That's a great goal. You'd be a millionaire at that point. All right. And now for our headline of the podcast, this is a news headline from this week. Kevin O'Leary from the Shark Tank, who calls himself Mr. Wonderful, is quoted as saying, I have no interest in being a crypto cowboy. Uh, Jason, what do you think about Kevin O'Leary's comments? Yeah, if you read the headlines, he was talking about how he's not going to just invest in any of crypto and put all his money into the riskiness because of the regulations that come in with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I'm a big believer in him. I, I believe that you should do a small portion of your portfolio, usually one to five percent, but don't put every dollar, especially getting towards retirement, do into crypto because we don't know how regulations are going to be in the future for cryptocurrencies. 
do you actually invest in crypto? Do you advise your clients to invest? What's your take on it? Yeah, so I invest a little bit into crypto, uh, but I always tell people you got to have the stomach for it because there's so much volatility in crypto where it can be up, but then it can drop down 20, 30, 40%. And you just have to have the stomach to do that. Um, some people don't have the stomach for it, while some people want to take that risk. You just have to understand your risk tolerance um, and how much risk you want to take for it and have a game plan and strategy towards it. Yeah, definitely. And when you look at the spectrum of risk and reward for any investment, right, I think it's safe to say cryptos are on that high risk um, but very high reward end of the spectrum. So you don't want to count on it for retirement. You don't want to put your life savings in it, but it's good to have a little bit of money in it to uh, check the box on that high risk investment. True. Very, very true. All right, Jason, now we have a fun segment on the cream podcast. We're going to talk celebrities. We're actually talking about those celebrities who make all the money. So these are the top paid U.S. celebrities in 2021. I have the list in front of me. Who do you think is leading the list? Yeezy, Yeezy, Kanye West. You think Yeezy's making all the money, huh? Him or Michael Jordan, one of them. Because Michael Jordan is selling Nikes and Jordan's still like crazy. So either one of them. Would you believe that the top person on the list of U.S. celebrities for pay or income in 2021 is Kylie Jenner? Over Kim Kardashian? That's crazy. Uh, Kim Kardashian's not even on the list. She's slipping. What? The top 10. I have the top 10. Kylie Jenner brought in 585 million. What the heck is she selling? Is it like cosmetics or something? I think she's selling some type of, yeah, cosmetics. I guess young girls like her cosmetics. That's insane. And her plastic though. surgery that she's done for herself. Yes. Half a <laughs> billion dollars. More than half a billion dollars. Crazy. Who's next That's on that list? Uh, we got Taylor Swift at 170 mil. Um, I don't know how she maybe she, I think with a lot of the people in the music business, it depends all on the deal they signed and distribution and how many of the rights they own, all that fancy stuff. I don't understand. But um, number three is Kanye West. So you were almost right. So Kanye and Taylor Swift, who was having beef a couple years ago, are in Kanye's now right behind her. Oh, yeah. this is hilarious. <laughs> so I don't know how accurate this is because, you know, like he's got his Adidas deals and other things like that. So um, but fourth on the list is the Eagles, the band, the Eagles, with that uh, song Hotel California, which I hate. But they must have some good royalties because they made one hundred and five million. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a classic song. Every sunny day that's playing on the radio, Norm, and it's always sunny days in California. That's true. That's true. And then this one is just head scratching. Uh, Dr. Phil, remember him? The the like psych, psychologist guru guy that started out on Oprah and all that. He made 95 mil last year. Dr. Phil made 94 million, 95 million. That's crazy. And then we fo followed it. It looks like a trend of these media, these media personalities followed by Howard Stern at 93 mil. And then we get into a, a couple athletes, Russell Wilson of the Seahawks, 92. Um, we have Dwayne The Rock Johnson at 90 mil. I thought he would make more, to be honest. He's in every single movie out there. Every week he has a new movie coming out. It's almost like an old No Limit uh, rap album where every week they have a new album. Every week he has a new movie. So it's it's like true. And I think him and Kevin Hart are probably the biggest uh, movie stars these days. And they probably... I imagine they just get paid whatever the heck they want. Um, so I'm surprised it was only 90 mil. Maybe next year he'll he'll jump up to 200 mil or something. Definitely. And then I was I would think I would assume Kevin Hart's right behind him at 89 million. I'm assuming. I don't see him on the list, so maybe this whole list is bogus. But I see Aaron Rodgers and LeBron are tied at about 89 million, and then Jay Z rounds out the top 10 at 81 million. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Kevin, get on the list next year, man. I know you're short, but you need to get up on this top 10 list. I there know you, you go. are. We've seen all these movies. Yeah, I think he'll be on there next year. Him and The Rock are moving up. I think we'll, we'll kick the Eagles out of the list next year. Yes, sir. All right, Jason. Now on the Cream Podcast, we're going to talk about businesses that failed. So we talk about all these people making money and people opening businesses and brands that are uh, soaring right now. Their stock is going great. But what about all those businesses that failed for whatever reason? So I'm going to introduce a few businesses. And I want to see if you could guess what actual name of the business or brand they were. Okay. All right. So let's do this here. So 
This first business that failed was founded in 1985. It revolutionized home movie watching and by 2004 had 9,000 stores across the US. But by 2010, only six years later, it was totally bankrupt with zero stores. Blockbuster. Blockbuster it is. You got it. And you actually, Norm, you know what? There's actually one Blockbuster left in Oregon to be funny with you. And they have nothing but old movies on VHS. There you go. Uh, So something about it. But Blockbuster was great. I was growing up. Blockbuster was such a big deal. You went to Blockbuster, you got your movie on a Friday, you got your, you went around, you look at the back of the, of the box and you got your movie and then you got the candy, your little candies at the front of the line. That was a great time growing up in, in seeing Blockbuster. Wow. It's crazy. They're no longer here. It was Blockbuster was a good deal. Um, and, you know, I think because it was VHS tapes, those were a lot more durable, remember? So like with DVDs, those could scratch pretty easy. They bend, they, you know, they weren't as, so I think that wouldn't work as well uh, with DVDs, though I know now they have um, all these DVD, what's it called? A red, red box or red door or something? They have yeah, like red a, box. D- yeah. It, so, and you know, what's funny is you just remind me when I was growing up, when PlayStation first came out, you could rent your PlayStation games from Blockbuster, but they charge you extra because of, they was worried about you scratching the CD or the yeah. disc for it. So that's a great reminder of it. And I just remember that was a big deal of renting video games on PlayStation front because before it was just you have to with the, the Super Nintendo games and, and Nintendo games. So in Sega. So now here's the interesting thing. Blockbuster was the top of the world. They really didn't have many, many competitors, right? They had cornered the market, but they failed because ultimately they failed to adapt. Like think about it in the long term. Of course, the digital music, digital movies, they didn't adapt at all to that, right? But why didn't they put a Pizza Hut inside every blockbuster or something like that? The thing is also in 2000, uh, in 2000, I think it was the year 2000 or 2004, Netflix actually approached Blockbuster and they said, we'd like for you to buy us out for 50 million. And at that time, the CEO of Blockbuster said, ah, Netflix is a, quote, very small niche business. And so he declined. And so think about the, the titan of the industry that Blockbuster could be if they had bought Netflix. Well, yeah, that's crazy. And that just tells you as a business, you should never get stuck with your morals. And you, you have to understand why people come to you. We went to, people, we went to Blockbuster because it was easy, it was convenient, and it was cheap to, mm. to rent a block compared to buying a movie that you're only going to see once, maybe twice. Right. And you have those three days while well, Netflix made it even more convenient by instead of you going way to Blockbuster, spending your gas and standing in line on a Friday, you can usually just click watch it from your home or just order it. At first, you could just order it and it'd be at your home. You didn't have to leave to go grab it. So very. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Now, this next business that failed. Let's see if you know what this one is. It was founded in 1937, reinvented photography with its instant film and cameras. Outcast even sang a song talking about this product, um, but it didn't adapt to di- digital photography and was bankrupt by 2001. At first, I thought you were going to say Kodak, but then you, you say instant, you know, instant uh, picture. So I'm going to say Polaroid on that one. Yep, you got it. Polaroid. So Polaroid, of course, had the instant film, instant development back in the in the 80s. I think it was 80s. Yeah, 80s and 90s. And it was a big hit. It was something really fun. And then that's basically where they stopped all their innovations and, uh, you know, outcasts probably pick up their sale a little, picked up their sales a little bit, but then they, uh, they completely failed after that. Yeah. And it was a big deal. I remember growing up, my dad had a Polaroid camera. He'd take tons of pictures and you, you shake it out like outcast says. And, <laughs> and I remember all of their photos, just like, Hey, everybody get together was on a Polaroid. Then I remember going to the clubs and when you go to the club, you used to take a photo backdrop of you and your friends or you or the or the lady you took to the club and you used to have a guy who took the picture and charge you a couple of dollars for it. And now that it's not there no more. So it's interesting. I wonder, too, the uh, it was sort of fun to shake it out and wait. Right. And see it develop in front of your eyes. I think that was part of their success, too. If you just had to, like, put it in a sealed envelope and then just wait you know, an hour and then take it out, it wouldn't be as fun, but it was pretty fun to actually sit there shaking it and watch it develop in front of your eyes. 
So true. And the, but you also realize that the quality of Vinci Star it was was horrible of the photos. You look at it a couple years ago, they, they dissolved more and more. So well, for me, actually, I like that because I look better when the quality is horrible in photos, <laughs> when I'm blurry and you can't see me. Like, is that a person? Yeah, he looks all right. <laughs> so. All right, now we got another business that failed for you. Let's see if you know this one. It's a little harder. Founded all the way back in 1948. It was once the Toy King with stores everywhere. But by 2017, they had a billion dollars in debt and filed bankruptcy. Is that KB Toy Store? We're talking about Toys R Us? No, oh, Toys R Us. I'm thinking about KB Toy Stores. It used to be in the malls growing up, but I remember they, they went bankrupt. I didn't think Toys R Us. Yeah, to Toys R Us was it. Did, what was it, Jeffrey Giraffe or something? Am, am I remembering that right? Was there yeah, Jeffrey Giraffe. And, it, and it's funny is I still, my mother still had this little step stool of Jeffrey Giraffe on it at her house that I had when I was like two, three, four years old. I used to sit or step up to grab something above in the cabinet, so... Yeah, I mean, and, and when you were little, going to Toys R Us was a big deal, you know, it's you were going to get something. It was like, you know, the I don't know, the adult version of going to the liquor store or something, you know, you were just happy, you know, super happy. You, you lose your parents, you start riding and you, you trying everything, riding on everything. And then you, then you tell your parents, hey, I want this or that. Those were that's an era that our kids will never see this day. It's not the same anymore. You yeah. don't have that. Amazon is not close towards it when it comes to the experience and the feeling of toys. I tell you that. Now, that's interesting. You brought up Amazon because that's a big part of the Toys R Us story and why they failed. So check this out. They failed to adapt. Toys R Us failed to adapt to e-commerce when everyone was going online and selling their own products. And, you know, early, mid 2000s, when it became very apparent that everyone should go online and have a digital platform. They actually signed a 10-year exclusive toy sales deal with Amazon in 2000. So they signed this contract. They were locked in. They thought Amazon was only going to sell Toys R Us toys. They were good. But Amazon actually broke the deal in bad faith and started allowing all other vendors to sell and individuals to sell toys. So Toys R Us was still locked in. So they sued Amazon in 2004. It took years of litigation and money and trying to get out of this contract and figure it out. But basically what it cost them was time. It cost them those prime years when everyone was transitioning to e-commerce and websites and online. So they missed the boat, basically. And it hurt them that bad where they just racked up so much debt and their stores became dinosaurs. Um, by 2017, they tried to sort of catch up and they invested $100 million in their website and online sales. But I don't even know if Toys R Us is still alive and kicking. Me either, man. That's sad that Jeff Bezos killed my childhood, man. Mm -hmm. Pretty you, you much. You make me sad right now that, toy, that Jeff Bezos killed my childhood. I think he is the Grinch, pretty much, huh? He is the Grinch. I'm sorry to say it, but he is the Grinch. All right, Jason, now in the Cream podcast, we're going to talk about crazy financial facts. And this backs up the segment we just had on business failures. But did you know that of all the Fortune 500 companies that existed in 1955, 88% of them are gone, vanished, vamos. Wow. That's crazy when you think about it. But I guess you missed some good ones. Like we just talked about those companies, but think about there's no more Enron. There's no more Datsun. There's there's tons of companies that merge or disappear. It's crazy when you think 88%. So that tells people when they always think the company or stock is always going to go up forever, it's not going to. Yeah, and, and Sears. I mean, remember Sears. So there was a lot of them that were iconic and on top of the world. And, you know, they were an American institution and they didn't adapt. Yeah, and you're talking about, so you got me thinking about even my career, or being my first jobs, my first jobs was at JC, was one of them was at JC Penney's, the other one was at Sears. And JC Penney's is on his last limb, struggling. Mm -hmm. And that was probably my easiest job ever being a watch repair man, where I walked the mall every, all day and hang out at the Cinnabon and come back just to put a battery in a watch. And then Sears, where I sold TVs when I was younger, and, and there's no more Sears. And just sad, man. And, I, and yeah. I remember Kmart even finally, Kmart merged with Sears. And then I remember as a kid, my mom used to put my, like my, uh, I had a starter jacket. Starter was big back in the early 90s. Oh yeah, starter and, jackets, yeah. I remember having it on layaway, at, my mom putting it on layaway and I, man, the good old days. 
the good old days, man. Yeah. But that's crazy that almost one in 10, you know, almost 90% of fortune 500 companies from uh, 1955 are completely gone. All right, Jason, now on the cream podcast. We're going to talk about something fun. We're going to talk about Netflix, which a lot of people are watching, myself included. And we're actually going to talk about Netflix notable renewals. So the formula for Netflix is they usually create two seasons to start and that's or a pilot season and then one or two seasons. And that serves as a start because they're paying their actors very little. They don't know if it's going to succeed or not. They don't know if the numbers are going to be there of people watching. And then they decide if they're going to renew it or not. So it's a big deal when we all fall in love with a series and then it actually gets renewed. We know we're going to get more content. Uh, This just happened, of course, with Narcos, which they renewed and we had another season. So I'm going to go down the list. I'm going to talk about the Netflix show or movie or series. And then you could give your comments here. So let's start uh, Stranger Things. Renewed. Renewed. (laughs) <laughs> so did you watch stranger things are you a fan i am not a fan i've never seen an episode i know i'm behind i know i need to see it it was pretty good actually i liked it it was, it was a half of the charm of it was nostalgia about the 1980s um which was really fun so it's interesting the cast is mostly i mean there's winona Ryder is the the top actress um but then most of it is kids and the cast were so young that they were making only about $250,000 each. So Netflix was making a bundle on that. But now they're, you know, five, six, seven years older. And now they probably have to pay them in the millions, not in the hundreds of thousands. But Stranger Things did get renewed. All right. Nice. Now, how about this one? Netflix series that everyone loves, Ozark. Renewed. Now that's renewed. my show. You like that's that one, That's my huh? show. I could binge watch on that Ozark. That's a fantastic show. I love it as well. Um, Originally, the writers for Ozark planned on five seasons. It always was spread out over five seasons. And we've gone through three seasons so far. Netflix just renewed, but only for a fourth and final season. So there'll be one more season to wrap it up. They said they want to end on a high point, but there was no real reason that they gave why uh, it wasn't renewed for a fifth season as well. All right, next one on the list. Um, this is us. Renewed. Renewed. Did you watch that one? I've never seen it. I have never seen it ever. All right. Well, if you watch This Is Us and you're a big fan and you love it, tell us about it because it definitely got renewed. Um, how about this one? Everyone knows this Grey's Anatomy. Renewed. Renewed for, believe it or not, a 17th season. That's crazy. I believe my wife and my son are binge watching on Grey's Anatomy. And then over Thanksgiving, me and my cousins, we was playing a game. Everybody should get a trivia game of questions about the 90s and 2000s. And I'm horrible because I don't watch Grey's Anatomy. And the question was, what city does Grey's Anatomy take place? Mm. And I did not know it. And my wife looked at me crazy because she has been watch, been binge watching on Grey's Anatomy on Netflix. Crazy. And knew it instantly. And I didn't know, I guess, New York and Chicago or Boston. I forgot what city. Yeah, I don't even know. But that's a lot of seasons. And now I guess a lot of the actors that were original, um, I forget the guy's name, but he started out as the head guy and they killed him off in season 11. And, you know, so now it's almost a totally new cast. I think there's only one lady, one actress who's uh, still with the original cast. Wow. And now we have this Netflix series, Lucifer. Renewed. Renewed. I've never seen it. <laughs> me either. You know, you have me feeling bad. Uh, it's, I guess, the fifth and final uh, season. The only thing I've heard about it is that uh, a lot of women love it. I guess the guys are all good looking on it. I don't really know. Um, so the last one on our list is The Mandalorian. Renewed. Renewed. And so this is a Star Wars offshoot. I'm old school. I like Star Wars one, two, three back in the, you know, 79 to the eighties. And after that, they all look really weird to me. Same, true. Same, same. True, true, true. And you know what, Norm, there's one other show I wish they renewed. I wish they renewed my buddy, Joss Leverett, K-9 Intervention for season two on Netflix with Callie K-9. That's what I'm looking forward to the most. 
Oh man, did did they uh, not renew it, or you just haven't heard if they're renewing it? If they're still working on it, Josh is a good gym buddy. I've been knowing him for years. Me and him work out a couple times a week. I just hope I mean, they haven't done it yet. They're still negotiating, talking. But I hope Netflix brings back the season two of Canine Intervention. So, and I love those shows. I mean, it's it's funny that the shows about animals actually are the more human or bring out the best of humanity in the in the programs, right? Um, but I, I could watch those all day long. So I'll, I'll check it out as well. Definitely, man. Hey, and Jason, that wraps up episode number three of the cream podcast. we got some serious momentum. We had a lot of fun. Thank you for your time. And what would you like to, to say to all your listeners and subscribers? Thank you everybody for getting on episode three or Tress was super excited. Uh, Doug loved this. Make sure you hit the subscribe button wherever platform you're on. Share it for some friends. We love to spread the word on the cream, cash rules, everything around me, uh, or us, I should say, podcast. Yeah, cream. Dollar dollar bills, y'all.